today on the Laura Flanders Show, Poetry and Trans Politics, with the performance group Dark Matter. I have, have a confession. confession. I have this insatiable addiction to coffee. Fair trade coffee. Fair trade coffee in NPR membership mugs. I want to wake up to that smell next to me, that and freshly pressed New Yorkers, and moleskin covers, and sweaty yoga mats. See, the truth is, I'm, I'm a, a snow, snow queen. queen. I just have this, this thing. For, for white, white people. people. <laughs> Can't help it. It's the way they eat steak for dinner. Mm. I know I'm a vegetarian, but I would make exceptions. I've heard that white men have huge... Empires. I've heard they're really good at... Gentrification. Once, a white woman asked me where I was from. No, where I was really from. Then she told me that she was going to India with her nonprofit that year. And I said, oh, tell me more. Oh, take me with you. The first white boy I slept with was so excited when I told him he was sexy. Like, I was the first person to say that. Like, ever in the entire world. You have to understand, I like it that way. Like, your veins are showing. Like, your skin could bleach out your clothes. Like, your SPF level is 9,000. Like, it, it just, just turns, turns me, me on. on. Like, I would love to cuddle in the ugliest sweaters with you and listen to David Sedaris and plan our future lives together. We can rent one apartment in Brooklyn and the other in the Mission and stare at the same chase-shaped constellations together at nighttime. I want you to pick me up on the way back from your unpaid internship. I want to jam in your Prius to your hip-hop. I want you to tell me more about your gap year. I want to map the lines on your palms to the lines you drew in Africa. I want to get my name tattooed on your arms in Sanskrit and then in Chinese. I want us to make black friends together. I want us to have brunch with them. I just, I just want us to get gay married in San Francisco. I want to pick up our travel print tuxedos together at American Apparel. I want to vote for Obama with you and name our ethnically adopted children, Hope and Post Race. On our wedding night, you will tell me about all the women of color artists that make you feel like a diva, such as Beyonce, and you will awkwardly gyrate me without your hips. Later that night, you will pull me aside and take nude photos of me, like that time you randomly selected me from the airport security check line. I, I love that. that. And when we're couch surfing together on our first honeymoon night, I will call you master, because colonialism never had a safe word. And you will whisper tenderly in my ear, Don't worry. Then, then f me, like, like you are. So that was a poem by Dark Matter, a trans South Asian performance art duo comprised of Alok Vadmanon and Janani Balasubramanian. They are deeply engaged in the connecting of arts with social justice, and they've been performing to sold out crowds all around the world in the last few months and more. I couldn't be happier to have you in the studio. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having us. And thanks for performing. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about how the two of you met. A little bit of your history. You're related to a former uh, show guest, Urvashi Vad, good friend of mine. You want to tell <laughs> You start. You start a little. Okay, okay, cool. Um, well, we, we tell the story a lot, so each time we like to say it differently. So I think it'll begin with the journey of our people here. <laughs> so essentially, oh, that's yeah. That's good, that's good. Uh, Jenny and I both come from Indian families um, who immigrated here from India. And like many sort of like upper caste, middle class Indian families who came, uh, we were raised with the expectations of assimilating, making a lot of money and being conventionally successful. Uh, but then there was this awkward part that we were trans. <laughs> uh, and there's not really that many trans or gender nonconforming Indians in diaspora because we're taught from a very young age that um, you should be as less visible as possible. Mm. And being trans is a way of bringing a lot of attention to yourself, <laughs> if you might. Um, and so because we were one of the only sort of trans and gender nonconforming Indians we knew, when we met in school, it was kind of this like huge moment of like, 
holy crap, we, like, <laughs> exist. Like, there are other people who are like us. And it was this, like, earth-shattering moment. Um, and so I think so much of our art and our activism comes from our experiences growing up and feeling erased, uh, our experiences growing up and feeling like there's no one else out there like mm. us. And I think what we really tried to do with our creative work is to rewrite the story of our, our immigration, to rewrite the story of our lives, um, to help sort of create a space for other trans and gender non-conforming mm. people who have been erased from our peoples and archives. Do you remember this moment, Janani? Or was... I remember this as many moments because it was over several years that we built together uh, an artistic practice and also an activist practice. And when we started touring, which is where we picked up the name Dark Matter, it was actually because our names were too long to together to fit on a standard playbill. Um, so we were like, okay, we need to come up with something shorter so that people aren't having to read out bad men and bottles of money every time they book us. Um, and Alok was like, okay, Jenny, come up with something science because I'm a science one. Um, and I was like, okay, dark matter and dark energy together comprise 96% of the universe, but they're only understood in their effects. Therefore, we're going to go with dark matter. Um, I just thought it sounded I think it Yeah, Alok just thought it sounded cute. <laughs> Um, and then we went on our first tour. We had no idea what we were doing. Um, so we sort of just stumbled through some very cold bus rides. Um, and then from there, uh, things just started evolving and shifting. After our first tour, we got the chance to uh, travel to Palestine together and work with and do artwork with, uh, as well as political work with the queer movement there, mm. um, which is, I think, was a really critical moment for us to develop a lot of frameworks and learn a lot from what they are doing around creating uh, space for queer and trans critique and political practice that are not rooted in sort of mainstream LGBT mm. politics. Like what? Tell, take us, um, tell us a little bit what you learned from the Palestinian colleagues. Sure. A lot of uh, their work uh, is rooted in community organizing, right? It's rooted in organizing their own people. Um, al Kaos, the organization we were working with, works on both sides of the wall. Um, and a lot of people are told this thing about how Israel is this uh, gay-friendly place, yeah. and this is gay Mecca, uh, that's the word they use, um, where you can go party and Palestinians are homophobic, right? That's the general standard messaging. Um, and what al Kaus does, in addition to their community organizing practice, in addition to creating space for queer Palestinians, uh, is pushes back on this narrative that Palestinians are homophobic and Israel is a safe yeah. place for gay people, um, which is very similar in some ways to how the U.S. positions. The U.S. is a safe space for gay people and all these backwards countries in Africa, South Asia, Middle East, Central America, basically everywhere else uh, are unsafe mm. places for gay and trans people, which as we know, because of escalating rates of violence against our communities, is not true, um, which as we know, because as soon as queer and trans migrants come to the U.S. border, they're thrown in detention centers, um, is not true. Um, and yet this myth allows a lot of violence to happen mm. in the name of queer and trans mm. bodies. And so that's the sort of... Uh, trajectory and a lot of the lessons that we took from what the Palestinian queer movement is doing. You've just been traveling all around Europe performing yeah. this, pe this piece and others. Um, well, I guessed it was Europe. I don't know. Um, what was it like there? What, what did you? Who did you perform for? Did they get get it? I think what really struck us the most about this trip is we always had this sort of stereotype that Europe was this very stodgy, white, sort of like bourgeois kind of space. But we met the sort of us of Europe. Mm -hmm. so we met a lot of children of migrants, a lot of queer and trans people of color there. And they were asking the same sorts of yeah. questions of how both of our countries are marketing themselves as LGBT friendly while simultaneously criminalizing yeah. our families. So we're put in this bind where there's a certain sense of purchase to our queer and trans identities that feels really hollow and rhetorical. Yeah. So it was really beautiful to make those connections and, and to talk about how things like pinkwashing are actually operating across the Western yeah. world, especially in Europe right now with the rise of nationalism, uh, the rise of Islamophobia. I feel, I feel like it feels more important than ever for queer and trans people of yeah. color to have the space to resist the incorporation yeah. of our identities into these racist problems. We're also seeing this incredible refugee migrant crisis, mm -hmm. um, which I can only imagine is more hell than I can even imagine for, for trans people trying to get across those mm -hmm. borders. Did you get any sense that there's solidarity networks or, or uh, an underground railroad, mm -hmm. if you will, for yeah. trans people? I think trans folks and especially trans feminine people so trans feminine people like me are people who were assigned male at birth 
but identify as either women or more feminine on the spectrum are often really erased from our conversations yeah. around migration um, because often the ways that we have to travel aren't like the sort of model minority migrant story. Right. <laughs> uh, they often have to do with sex work. They often have to do with trafficking. They often have to do with drug trades. Um, and in a lot of ways, presenting as a trans person of color is already being, and especially as, as a trans woman of color, a trans feminine person of color, is being associated with being a sex worker. And there's a long history of, of our bodies being seen as contagions, right? Mm. So I think even a lot of sort of organizations that are working on refugee issues, working on immigration issues, still aren't trans comprehensive. And they also have this particular like violence of expecting that trans looks a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, and trans is not one aesthetic. So if you have a trans woman fleeing from some country in the Middle East, another trans woman fleeing from South Asia, who's to say that they look anything alike, right? So trans should be about self-identification, mm -hmm. not what we look like. And I think what often happens when we talk about trans immigration narratives, we already have a stereotype mm -hmm. of what a trans person should look like. Well, you made a really great video, Alok, and maybe you were both involved, but for, um, uh, is it Regional 29? Refinery 29, Refinery 29 uh, the lifestyle site, uh, where you made the case that combating gender binaries is something that everybody should have a stake in. Mm -hmm. For people who are just trying to get their head around this, can, can you make that case clear totally, for our folks? Absolutely. One of the jokes we always have is we meet a lot of leftists who are like, yeah, I'm down to talk about how everything's socially constructed, but then when you say, the gender binary is also a lie. They're like, wait, what are you talking about? That's too much. Um, I think it's really important to understand that this thing called male and female and this thing called man and woman are recent historical con uh, constructions that have everything to do with racism and colonialism. And that I've never actually met anyone in my life who fits every single norm or stereotype about what it is to be a man or what it means to be a woman. Mm -hmm. And yet we keep on thinking that these fairy tales are relevant. So for me, I think we all actually have a stake in recognizing that there are as many genders as there are people in the world, that all of our intersections of our experiences, our identities, the ways that we've presented ourselves um, mean that actually no two women are the same. <laughs> There's no such thing right. as a universal gender. I don't feel the same from day to day, yeah, frankly. Totally. <laughs> you want to perform something else? Yeah, sure. Uh, sure. Take a pick. Um, this next poem is a poem I wrote about my father. Um, I feel like a lot of trans narratives tend to be about our mothers, but sort of what I was saying before, I think we actually have to transform masculinity as well. And I've been thinking a lot about how so many South Asian men I know never consented to being men, that what racism did was racialize them and gender them as these sort of savage brown men. So this is a poem about thinking about how my dad's masculinity is related to my own transness. Let's take a look. When I'm 11 years old, my father tells me that the parking lot smells a lot like marijuana. To say that I'm scandalized would be an understatement. You see, I was the prude love child of my middle school's D.A.R.E. program, which means that I was taught from a very young age that the minute you consume drugs, you become a very, very bad person. So when my father insinuates that he knows the smell, I judge him to be an evil man and tell him to confess immediately or I'm running away from home. He laughs and says, the things you will never know about my past. I have never asked my father who he dated before my mother. I have never asked him about his first kiss. I do not know what he hoped his life would look like and whether or not that came true. You see, there's this thing that happens when you call someone a father. He ceases to become a person and instead becomes a punchline for everything that you hate about yourself. He becomes a parable, as if on that day two new people are born. Everything he is in this moment is now history, his story. There's this thing that happens when you are trans, when you know you are not a man because you know you are not your father's son. And the moment you tell him this, he becomes everything you are running away from. So in this way, being trans is another way of saying, I am running away from home. I have never asked my father what it felt like to become history, to watch 30 years of memory coil inside of his gut so that every time he laughed, he could remember what it felt like to be young again. There's a VCR tape in the living room drawer. Fast forward to the scene where a man who would have looked like me if I hadn't have run away from my father walks out next to a woman radiant enough to be the sunshine when I first opened my eyes. This is my parents' wedding video. In this shot, my father's best friend tells him that he can no longer be a rebel now that he's a married man. This is how I discover that my father used to be a rebel. 
When I meet his friends from college, they tell me that he spent most of his time hanging out with a man named Karl Marx and a dream of a decolonized India. They tell me I look just like him. And I want to say, no, I'm not a man. I mean, I'm not that man. My father laughs at me in this video. The same way he will laugh 15 years later in a parking lot. The same way he laughs when I'm back home and use words like revolution and now, and he tells me that he believes in incremental change. So, of course, I accuse him of being a middle-class liberal who's come to care more about his private property than he has his people, and he tells me that there's this thing that happens when you grow older, when you begin to recognize that you are no longer invincible, which is, I think, my father's way of finally admitting that he was never invincible. That his hands were so sweaty from being afraid of all of the ways that I began to look just like him that he could never quite hold on to me. Which is, I think, my father's way of finally admitting there are things I had to give up in order to have you. I gained the confidence to yell on the streets because I learned early on how to fight my father. I have been shouting at him for the past six years and calling it a relationship instead of a riot. Because maybe that's my way of convincing myself that I see myself in the flames. And maybe that makes all the difference. There is no question that we, the movement has a long way to go mm -hmm. when it comes to taking on some of these broader questions. And, and you've actually been very critical, both of you, of the mainstream LGBT movement. Um, can you explain why a little bit? Whew. I do that all day. <laughs> Well, it's like we always like to say, rainbows are just refracted white light. Gay rights are wrong. Um, honestly, the, the mainstream LGBT movement is not really a movement at all. It's a marketing scheme. Uh, it was created specifically so that white, wealthy people could position themselves as victims of the very systems that they're upholding. This is not even a figurative thing, right? It's like a bunch of rich, white, gay lawyers got together and said, hey, uh, the black civil rights movement has done really well. Let's copy them. Um, and of course, when white rich people are appropriating those tactics, they succeed. They do really well. So I mean, to be fair, they would say there are all these rights that are denied to people who can't get married. But we've managed to win all these rights yeah. for people all over the country, the most vulnerable, or perhaps the people that are benefiting from these rights most. But then they'll oddly be very silent when we say violence against trans women of color yeah. is increasing, incarceration is increasing, detention and deportation and criminalization are increasing. And that right? a lot of people are forming families specifically in those really harrowing situations that don't look like right. married couples. And where are the dif where are the protections for those yeah. capitalist non-conforming communities? Jealousy is hard to talk about without feeling small. Love means having the same conversations over and over. Love means listening differently every time. I've spent the last six years unlearning all the ways my parents communicate. I still have the same conversations with my mother every day. She asks me when I am coming home and if I have a job. Once a year, my mother tells me she's depressed. Today, I tried watching everyone on the train like they had a broken heart. There is something so warlike and old about people on the train in the evenings. You can grow so old waiting for wars to end. My friend who is going through a breakup asks me to come over and watch him cry so he can get out of bed sometimes. He asks me to tell him where the pain is coming from. I point to a place. He says, that's right. It was just getting hard to tell. His heart breaks so loudly it ruptures mine. Some love stories do not end like anyone is right or wrong. People can just walk away from each other on their now broken feet. My friend will stay put until the breakup is real and bone shattering. I can't say stop because I wouldn't do different or haven't tried. Love is excessive to the point of survival. I keep telling my friends I love them in an effort to give the word love meaning. Every love story is eventually a ghost story. I'm reading a gay book that feels like the words out of my own mouth. Loving other writers means I'm always left both jealous and hungry. Half my anxiety comes from doing things that I love. If you stopped eating love stories back to back, you might remember that you aren't hungry. I'm glad my old lover flew away and didn't break my feet. I keep making haunted houses out of people. Sometimes there isn't enough time to invent new language from one person to the next, so we say the same words behind their backs to their faces. I love you sounds like. I stole this feeling somewhere. In just a year, 
Certain parts of this story have already become my ghost story. Many of them are ordinary places, like kitchens and street corners. When I open my mouth in the village, bats fly out. There's something in the air this winter, stringing airplanes and bombs and hearts and money to a single line of gunpowder. Every story I'm writing feels terrifying under its surface. I have this ungrounded fear that a poem and a bomb are two parts of the same rupture. Like we are just watching each other survive more. And this time, it's not even beautiful. So let me ask you a question about one of the topics that's coming up under the Obama administration, which is this question of trans inclusion in the military. Are you checking this off as a great agenda item achieved? Oh, uh, no. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's this really weird thing happening right now where you sing a lot of people speak about trans rights, and I wonder who exactly they're talking about. And who they're talking to. Because <laughs> <laughs> the average trans person is actually incredibly poor, is living under incredible violence and duress. What we actually need is economic justice, racial justice, housing, I could be less concerned with participating in U.S. militarism. And I also tell people, every trans woman of color and trans feminine person of color who has to survive in this country has already had to be a soldier. Yeah. Because if you look at the rates of PTSD in our <laughs> mm -hmm. communities, the rates of suicidality, the rates of chronic pain, every single day we have to fight for our legitimacy, right? So focus on those warriors, you know? Focus on the people who are being denied from homeless shelters, the people who aren't being denied from getting adequate health care. Like, that, that, those are the campaigns we should be taking. You're being very careful to say trans feminine, not trans woman. Do you want to talk about the thinking behind that for a second? Oh, totally. I really feel like we're in a terrible moment right now where we're talking about gender as if it's still in the binary, yeah. even when it has to do with trans. And there are actually a lot of people who experience transphobic violence who don't identify as trans. Mm -hmm. So I want to uplift just two days ago, there was a black gender nonconforming person in Detroit who was murdered uh, because they were wearing a dress and they actually did not identify as transgender at all. But in that moment, they were read as someone who was a boy trying to be a woman, mm -hmm. right? So actually, a lot of hate violence affects gay men especially black gay men, affects gender nonconforming people like me who don't identify as women, but when we're red or when we're street harassed are seen as trans mm -hmm. men. So I think when we only talk about violence against trans women, we're actually erasing the whole spectrum of violence because often it's not about how we identify, it's how our perpetrators of violence see us. So because I harassers don't have this sophisticated understanding of what people's identities right. are, right? They see you in a moment and they want to beat you up. That's the thinking behind it. Well, talking about seeing in a moment, we got some pushback the other day on our show from somebody on Twitter saying, uh, you are supporting erasing women uh, oh. in favor of men with gender dysphobia. Mm. Oh, that's Are you about one. erasing women? Wow. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, Honestly, it's really funny being trans on the internet, I have to say, because what we never talk about is that like being trans or gender nonconforming on the internet means your image circulates across the world and everyone's baggage and anxiety around gender gets flung up. Like, what's in your pants? <laughs> like, around that piece around erasure, I think that that's actually an act of erasure because what it does is it actually doesn't talk about how trans women and trans feminine people have been doing feminist organizing forever mm -hmm. <laughs> that actually colonization on this land was about trans misogyny. It was mm -hmm. about, look at these indigenous peoples, these men in dresses, that actually Stonewall was about trans women and trans feminine people of color resisting police violence. Mm -hmm. That a lot of feminist victories would not be here if it was not for trans women and trans feminine people. And presumably and I think if you're really looking for people who are erasing women, trans wouldn't be in the very front line of my own yeah. no. problems. And I think there is this particular brand of radical feminism that actually does itself a disservice by saying trans women are not women because what that reduces women to is vaginas, which is misogyny, yeah. um, and has been misogyny actually produced by the doctors who surgically alter children's bodies at birth, yeah. right, to match this idea of a vagina and the idea of a penis. Um, so when we're going to talk about original sites of violence, it is that doctor, it is that uh, whoever it is, the lawyer who created two f sets of boxes you can check on a form, uh, and not trans people who are out here just trying to live our lives. Trans people aren't the problem. Gender binaries are the problem. I love it. I'll leave <laughs> it right there. Thank you both. Great to have you. Thanks for having Thank us. Thank you for having us.